So before we start on troubleshooting, uh, let me just get the machine to warm up here. I'm going to pass this around. This is, now this is not a commercial grade, you know, uh, fluke multimeter, super expensive, oh my God, I'm a pro. This is sort of like, I want a multimeter with a clamp on, amp meter, you know, light use, right? My technicians don't have this. They're geeking out and they're going with more expensive models because they're doing it, that's their trade, it's their livelihood, right? But in terms for a boater, someone that is using a multimeter for light use, this multimeter with a clamp on, right? So you don't even have to disconnect a circuit to see what the amps going through the circuits are going or doing. You can just literally clamp on and you can literally see, is my windlass drawing too much power? Is my inverter drawing too much? What's my fridge doing? Is, it, is my fridge on? Is it drawing any power? I think, I can't hear the compressor, but is it drawing any power? You can literally put that around a single conductor, right, the positive or the negative, and you'll actually be able to see if a device is drawing power. Or you might be curious, <clears throat> which I encourage everyone to be, curious is good, you might be saying, I actually want to know what my loads are drawing on my boat. I don't know. Like, how much does my fridge draw? Right? How much does something draw? You're just, you want to know. You don't have a battery bank monitor, and you don't know what the amps are, and you're kind of curious. Like, how much does your anchor light draw? You'd be shocked. If you don't have an LED one, it is like, oh my God. You could lose on a sailboat running that anchor light. No joke, a third of your battery your, a third to a quarter of your battery usage in a day could be your anchor light. That's crazy. Like, just in context, that's crazy. Like your fridge is 60%. Some my anchor light on my Catalina was over almost close to two amps. Two amps for 10 hours, that's 20 amp hours. My fridge is 60. A third of my daily amp hour consumption on my boat for my fridge was my anchor light. I changed it to LED. It literally is a factor of 1 11th. The anchor light could stay, I mean, I don't feel it. I mean, and now it's 0.2. It's nothing. It's a joke. So my anchor light on my boat is on all the time. When you come in an anchorage and you see no anchor light there, I don't think it's because people forget to turn an anchor light. Probably 50% of boats don't have anchor lights, at least 60, 70%. And I don't think it's people don't know what an anchor light is. I'm going to assume that they know. But let's assume... Why would they not turn it on? I think they're making a decision. They're like, you know what? I can't afford to turn it on. I can't. So I'm just hoping that someone's going to see me at night. And I figure that nobody comes in an anchorage at night. But this would tell you if you have a problem, you could measure it, quantify it, and say, you know what? I think next time I'm going to have a rigger or someone go up the mast, I'm going to change my anchor light to an LED version, right? And I'm going to save literally, I'm going to draw down my power consumption by a factor of 90% down. That's substantial. So I'm going to pass this around. And that's the one I would recommend. The LEDs are just, uh, got LED well, yeah, you want to make sure it's a navigation LED bulb, but yes. Like not all anchor lights, not all bulbs are the same, but yes. You can buy navigation anchor light LED bulbs, right? Yeah, go ahead. How small a wire will the clamp on feature? Oh, anything. It doesn't matter. Every... You know this whole thing, I didn't understand, like, that's the one thing about engineering is that it took the mystery of the universe less mysterious. Because I remember growing up, I was like, why is it that people complain of living under power lines? And they were like, oh, you know, it's dangerous, magnetic field. I'm like, what the hell? The lines are so far up. Like, what does it matter? Well, the amps are so great, even though it's high voltage, that every wire has magnetic flux going through it. There's a magnetic field that comes through a wire. A way to offset that is actually twisting the wire. That's why some wires are twisted. Twisted pair to offset that magnetic flux. But wires and cables are just straight. And so every wire has actually a magnetic flux that goes through it. And the orientation of that field, like this or like this, will tell the direction of if the current is a pull or a draw. A pull or a charge, I mean. So you can actually tell. Are my batteries being charged or discharged? They will actually give you polarity on the current. Not just the amount of current going through, but actually am I getting a charge or am I getting a discharge? So, I mean, that device is, I'm not sure online, I can't remember. $189. $189 US or Canadian? Canadian. $189 Canadian. I don't know if someone has hired a pro to work on their boat. 
but the labor rates are will make that device pay itself pretty sh quickly. And most of the so-called experts that work, self-proclaim experts that work on your boat won't have one because, again, they're fortunate, they're infused with knowledge. And generally their advice when something's broken is replace it, right? They don't diagnose, they don't isolate a problem. It's too hard, right? And their advice, I hear it all the time, someone told me my GPS, my chart plotter doesn't work, my GPS has failed, it's time to replace the chart plotter. I'm like, you mean your radar, your sounder, your chart plotter, all those multiple of thousands of dollars you're gonna replace because your external GPS antenna, that's an internal battery, has failed. We're gonna just throw it all away. Well, that's what my advice was, I was told. I'm like, okay, well, you could do that, or we could simply replace the external GPS and everything's still gonna work. So that's what you do with stuff like that, right? You isolate a problem, and then you decide as a boat owner, you say, okay, do I want to spend more money than I need to because I want to have a new navigation system or am I just going to do what I need to do to repair what's broken? All right, so we're going to get started about troubleshooting theory, okay? Troubleshooting is the end game in life in terms of technical skills. That's it. You could be an amazing installer, an incredible electrician in terms of doing something. You could be a god, the fastest you understand. But when it comes to troubleshooting, it's a completely different approach. I have technicians who are really great at installing that might not be so good at troubleshooting. And I have people that are terrible at installing. They don't have good hand coordination. They're not good. But they're great at troubleshooting because troubleshooting is a conceptual thing. It's, a, it's about understanding how things work. You don't need to be a doer to troubleshoot. You need to be someone that understands how things work. Once you understand that, you can actually provide direction to yourself or to others to resolve a problem. But it all comes down to understanding how something works. Okay? <clears throat> so just going at it is not going to help. You have to understand how something works to be actually effective at troubleshooting. First point is, ups, of course, with troubleshooting, and I mentioned that a little bit earlier. Generally, the problem is going to be on the interconnections between devices on your boat that failed, right? Something powering the device, something feeding the device. Generally, it can happen. The device might have failed, but your first hunch should be it's probably not getting what it needs to work, right? That should be your first hunch. So that means start working through the circuit. Next is, <clears throat> what are the typical problems on boats, right? You don't have power to device, that's really pop popular, and that's, or common, and that's why we talked about electrical a little bit this morning, because that's an essential skill to know, are, am I getting some sort of voltage at that device so it can actually work? The other one, which is a really good point, is battery voltage is too low. Remember what I talked about earlier, I said, is everything working when you're on shore power, you have your battery charger connected, and it's powered, and everything works. If it works at 13.3, 13.5 volts, if your boat voltage is about 12, then that means that, oh, okay, good, so it's probably a connection issue, that means that there's so much resistance down the line that when your battery voltage gets to 12, the appliance voltage is maybe 10.5, 9.5. So battery voltage is, don't ever assume that what's at the battery is out of the appliance. Far from it. You could lose one volt, one, I've seen one volt, two volts, three volts, and it can get worse and worse. I had saw once a fridge on a boat that had sunk where the boater had been giving wrong information that a boat that sink wasn't a really big deal, and he was told to that he could easily repair it by just changing the panel. And that's the only thing he had to do was worry about changing the connections of the panel. Now that was some seriously bad advice. <laughs> that's an understatement. And we came on board. This is after someone had just changed the panel. And the fridge would never work. But there was 12 volt at the fridge if you disconnected the wire. 12 volt at the fridge under no load. Soon as you apply a load, 
If you were able to put your multimeters on the wiring, under load, meaning when the fridge would turn on, the volts would drop to two. The connection was so corroded that as soon as a small load, like a fridge doesn't draw a lot, it's five amps, three amps, four amps, as soon as that four amp load would be applied, the voltage would drop all the way down to two volts. The connections at the fridge had never been redone. The boat had sunk, the fridge had been replaced, but the connections at the fridge had never been redone and they were corroded. The boat had sunk in salt water. Corrosion on the terminal or the connector, right? A broken wire can happen, but in my experience, and it's extremely rare, wires don't break other than if a fuse blows or if a terminal gets undone. You know those god-awful spade connectors that you, we see on our boats that some builder thought was a really good idea because it takes too long to undo a, a nut and to put a ring connector on, right? You see that on a lot of panels. Like, they'll actually have push-on spade connectors, right? They're not a fork. They're not a ring. You likely push them on, and you can pull them out. Starters are like that, believe it or not. I have that on my boat. Hotham Sound, Harmony Islands, 2006 inaugural trip. I'm on the boat. I'm a systems engineer. I have an electrical engineer and I have another electrical engineer. We hang around together, of course. Didn't understand what the hell was going on. Fresh out of school, right? I know nothing. School doesn't teach you much other than maybe you can figure it out later. And our starter wouldn't start. What the issue was, the spade connector on the starter solenoid was loose. As soon as you'd actually apply the starter button, there's a little bit of load to run the solenoid. The voltage would drop and the starter would barely click, but not enough to be engaged to let the current go through the solenoid to actually the starter. I didn't understand that. Didn't have a clue. Nobody could figure it out. Well, we certainly couldn't. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. But that was because of a spade connector, right? Same thing on the back of a panel. Those little connectors can actually come off. Or what happens is over time, they, they're not as friction, right? They're actually, they've opened up. And you put them in there, they're loose. And they vibrate off, right? Because your boat doesn't live in a garage where there's no vibration. It's in the water. Sometimes the waves, you're actually dropping off a face of a wave, right? There's forces there, right? So don't worry so much about a broken wire. It can happen, but it's extremely, extremely rare. It's generally a connection issue that, that you're gonna find. Shafe wire is definitely a problem. Also a little bit rare. It's sort of another break. It does happen, it does happen. If you're going offshore, shafe is a real problem because your boat's moving 24-7 every day, all the time. There's no such thing as being at an anchor. Like, there's not a lot of anchors in British Columbia. Like, you go anywhere else, 360 anchorages don't exist, right? I mean, we're in bomb-proof anchorages everywhere here. You go in the Caribbean, there's no bomb-proof anchorages like we have here. There's very few, right? And so at night, you're constantly moving. And as you're moving, if the wires are not properly tied down, they're chafing, right? And that rubbing eventually could cause a short. And that, I have to say, is a blown fuse or breaker has got to be top of your list. Remember back when I said at the beginning, you got to know where your fuses are? Well, that's essential because if you're looking for a fuse or you decide that you're going to put your fuses in your boat sporadically everywhere throughout the boat as you see fit. You're not gonna put them at the beginning of the circuit or at the end of the circuit because you might have a fuse for the wire and then have a fuse for the appliance. Like on my boat, I've decided that I'm gonna fuse all my appliances with one fuse at the beginning of the circuit that is both there to protect the wire and the appliance. All my fuses are at the start of the circuit. Even though the appliance is far away, I'm fusing everything at the beginning of the circuit. You could put a fuse for the wire at the beginning and then a fuse for the appliance, but then you've got two fuses in the circuits. And I'm not putting them randomly. We talked about that yesterday. I'm putting the fuses at the beginning of the circuit. And it's not a choice, it's a half two. Okay, black and white. <coughs> and you can obviously use your meter to test an entire circuit in sequence. Right, and you would do that to continuity or volts. You just chase it down, is there volts here, volts there, volts there, oh, no volts, why? What happened between here and there? Okay, so 
This is a typical NMEA 01A3 network. I call it Old English, I call it Latin. It's the way that things used to communicate with one another for electronics, okay? Definitely still out there, 1983 is when it was started. Nothing came out that, it took a while. Like NMEA 2000 didn't come out in 2000, came much, much later. But that's when it got start spearheaded. The challenge with this type of topology, and by the way, pretty much every single one of you have that on your boat. If you don't know you do, you do. Devices all have NMEA 01A3. Very few have NMEA 2000 only. And all older devices prior to probably 2007, 2008 are going to be 01A3 only. Or CTOC, which is a proprietary bus network that's owned by uh, Raymarine. The challenge with this type of topology when you're trying to troubleshoot, and we're going to talk a little bit about that, you're troubleshooting systems, is that this system is sort of like human communication. There's a talker and there's a listener. And the talker and the listener are on separate. So when I talk to someone, they listen. And when they talk, right, it's on a different channel. So it's not a single channel communication. You'll have one wire where I talk, they receive. Another wire where they talk, and then I receive. So a talker, listener. Okay? Sender, receiver. Everything is about who's doing the talking and who's doing the listening. And then it gets more complicated. I can talk to many people in a room. But not many in the room can talk to me at the same time, right? Because there would be too much noise. So then you have to start making decisions. I am, for example, a multifunctional display or a GPS. I will send my GPS information to multiple places that want to listen to it. Chart plotter, maybe a radar, a VHF, right? But then the VHF might only communicate on one port to the chart plotter. An autopilot might be send and receive only for routing information. It might receive GPS information for route, and it might send its heading to two places. It might send it to the radar, and it might send it to the chart plotter. So you have to constantly, and what I would say when we deal with NMEA 01A3, and there's a reason why they went to 2000. If I'm losing you, it's because it gets intense. And this is a simple network. Like we do some networks that have 20 devices, 30 devices. And this is where you got to draw it out. Bravado has no place with electronics. If you think you're smarter than everyone else and you're just going to do it, congratulations. Your life will be definitely more complicated than it needs to be. I would say if you have anything in MEA, what you want to do is you want to remember that everything is context driven. And especially we get this all the time because most of our VHFs are not NMEA 2000, but they want to receive an NMEA 01A3 signal for GPS position, right? Because otherwise that DSC functionality is not going to work. But if you're actually interconnecting the wires on the wrong position, you're having a talker talk to a talker and a receiver to a receiver, nothing's going to go through, right? That's why NMEA 01A3 has its limitations and why NMEA 2000, which is a bus topology, is much better. Here's, I'm not trying to scare you, but this is where it gets interesting, is now this is what it gets to on the bigger boats. You know, on those trawlers, on those big boats that had older technology that were trying to integrate everything. These are all these sort of devices, you know, two GPSs are going to one device. Then you got multiplexers. Then you might even have, sometimes what you're going to have to happen is you're going to, we talked about it, there's so much information coming, I need to start prioritizing information from one place over another place. Then you literally have to go into a laptop and say, I don't want these sentences to go through. I know you've got all this information, but I don't care. I want you to block 99 of them, and I only want you to let one through. So you're actually starting block info, you're letting it through. So folks that have maybe, this starts happening around 50 footer. 50, 55, 60, 70, 80 footer. At that range, you're starting to have a network like that. And then that way where it's not easy because there's a lot of pieces in the puzzle that are actually trying to make it all work. And that all happens at NMA 01A3. 
So if you're troubled shooting an enemy A0183, just remember to go very slowly, look at the color codes, and remember when someone says, I'm a talker and receiver, the other one, you don't connect talker to talker and receiver to receiver. A talker talks to receiver, right? And the talker here talks to receiver down below. Everything is context driven. I see this all the time. People are connecting talker to talker, receiver to receiver, and nothing goes through. And the most simplest, uh, simplest um, example would be VHF radios, right? That's the normal way that people interconnect their VHF radios for GPS is over NMEA 10183. If you're lucky enough have to have an NMEA 2000 network, then it makes your life much easier because it's a bust apology. You don't have to worry about any of that. Any questions before I leave NMEA 0183 on a boat? Uh, you check each module to know if that module is actually operating. Yeah, that's a, another good question. How would you see, so you've done the work, and, and you want to figure out, a lot of MFDs will actually have, you'll go into a port, you'll go and start going in the menu. So now you're going, you're putting your hat on, you're like, we're going deep. You'll go through a menu, you're going to go communications, enemy is in and you're going to go buffer. Or something. You're going to have some sort of seal, and they're going to a stream of consciousness. Major, remember the matrix? That's what it is, and it's going to start showing you all these lines, and then you can start it and stop it because it's constantly going. And you're like, just start filling up the buffer, start, stop, and then you go through the lines, and you can start seeing all the sentences that are received, which don't make any sense to you. They're not saying like depth. Depth receive is 48.4. No, it's a little bit more cryptic than that. And then you go through it and you're like, oh yeah, I'm looking for, for example, we're troubleshooting an autopilot. And we're saying, is the autopilot sending heading? We're losing heading on the chart plotter. So we go into the buffer on this chart plotter and we're looking and we're seeing, where's the heading sentence? I'm not seeing it. And sometimes what happens is it's overcrowded. There's too much information happening on a multiplexer. There's so much information coming in, it's getting lost. And then, so when you do is process of elimination. <laughs> Let's remove all variables. Let's turn everything off. Let's just have autopilot only talking to chart plotter. Oh, then it starts slowing down. You're like, okay, it's there. As soon as we turn one thing, okay, that's fine. You turn another, eh, it's, we're losing. You turn another fourth one, then it starts to be sporadic. You're like, oh, overloading of information on that bus. And that's where then you go, can we increase the bus speed? Oh, yeah, we're not using AIS. It's only 4,800. We could go to 3,800. 38,400, let's increase the bus speed, go faster. Now does it work? Yeah, higher throughput, no problem. So you do the diagnostics on your probably multifunctional display. You're never going to be able to do that on an autopilot or an instrument. Or if you totally geek out, then you would have a device like this. And some of them will actually have a USB port. And you can then go with software. And then you're talking like full geek. You're looking at the sentences and everything else, and now that's not probably for the light of heart. You know, the, the rule is, and honestly, I'm the same. Like, I'm good up to a certain level, but I've got a few guys on my team that are way better than I am. And everything has a pay grade, right? Like, I, I'm a concept guy, but I'm not out in the field like some of my technicians. Some, some of them, every time it gets really, really, really intense, I'm like, congratulations. You're paid to think. Right? I'm considering you my little Navy SEAL. Right? You're making the big box. So I'm putting you, drop, dropping you right in there, and you're going to figure it out. And then they ask me, how much time are you giving me? I'm like, we've got the go-ahead four hours, eight hours, whatever. You go in there and start scratching your head. And if you want to, we'll put up a chat channel. We'll put up multiple people. You want someone else? Let us know. And then everyone at one point get to a top level. And I get to a top level too. And sometimes my technicians, it gets, well, one of them maybe not, but most of them get to a top level and like, okay, who can we talk to? Ask a friend, ask an engineer, ask a colleague in another business, right? Then you start relying on other people. You're, the point is with troubleshooting, you're always going to find a limit to your own skill set. And then you start bringing in experts, right? 
So those are sort of the limitations of NMEA 01A3. And as we started, all of us, adding more and more and more electronic devices on our boats, right? Because remember, before it was like, you had a depth sounder, maybe, a VHF, and then, okay, you went crazy, you had a wind instrument. Okay, then it got really crazy, you decided to add a GPS, right? But then it just started going past that, right? It was like, then it's like a GPS, and then I want AIS. Then I'm having like multiple sensors. Then I'm like, for example, here, you've got some of those modules, we're doing engine integration at NMEA 183. Right now I want information. It just, it just went full crazy. And so it wasn't enough. And so then what they did, they invented this. Now, <clears throat> This is a Garmin view of an NMEA 2000 backbone, but it doesn't matter. We're gonna talk about Garmin, Furuno. Everyone plays nice in NMEA 2000. So what you have here are T's, okay? By the way, this was not invented by the marine industry. Um, this was actually invented by Bosch. This is used in robotics. And they simply adapted this technology to go on boats, okay? It's a control network, CAN. You have one single backbone. That backbone has a maximum length, but for most of us, it's not gonna be a challenge. On a big, big boat, like a 100 footer, then it starts being a challenge as you gotta go multiple levels up on a boat. But on a normal boat, like a 50, 60, 20, 30, 40, unless you get to a super, not a super yacht, but like a big, big boat, you're not gonna have a big challenge with this backbone length. The essential key, and again, remember this is something, people ask me this all the time now because we've got people, I've got people calling me and I'm troubleshooting problems from everywhere now, like not even in the continent. And they're like, Jeff, I would like you to be here, but how do I go about finding someone locally? And I always think about how I do and I find someone myself. I'm like, first thing is, you never ask someone a simple question where they're gonna know the answer and then tell you what you wanna hear. Because everyone in general, there might not be as honest or forthcoming about their troubleshooting skills because they simply want the work. So it's not good enough to say to someone, oh, do you know NMEA 2000? How many people are gonna say no? The good people are gonna say no if they don't know. But there's a subset of people that will say yes and they don't know. And so what you want to do is you want to suss out, are they really qualified or are they pretending to be qualified? And why I bring that up is, this is pretty straightforward to install an NMEA 2000 backbone, but I cannot tell you how many NMEA 2000 backbones I've seen installed by so-called people that know that is wrong. It's crazy, right? Because people are just amateurs and they're just trying it and they don't educate themselves. Like my technicians and myself, I went through an NMEA 2000 certification, right? Sort of what you're doing, I'm also curious. I'm like, okay, show me how it works. I wanna know. So the essential thing, and this is not gonna be the case on many of your boats, a lot of people think these are end caps. These are called, you see here, it's hard to see, female resistor, male resistor. These are absolutely essential and there can only be two. On a lot of boats, what they're doing is they don't understand that there's a backbone, they think, or these are just plugs. Plug it. And what they're doing is they're not having a backbone to the boat, they're actually having branches and everything else. And it's not one continuous backbone, it actually they have spurs and it goes everywhere. And they don't understand that you need only one resistor at the end and another resistor at the end of the backbone. So that's a big problem with NMEA 2000 is that the person installing it doesn't draw it out, right? Because if you draw it out, you'd see right away that there's a problem. Or even if the installer didn't know, you'd look at it, you're like, it looks like nothing I've ever seen before. And you're like, well, that looks wrong. And then you know enough to say, well, maybe I should call someone who might know more than whoever did my system. Jeff, I have a question. How do you not have a uh, volt dropage in that system? Oh, you do? Absolutely. Absolutely, you do. Absolutely, there is volt dropage. And that's why there's a maximum number of nodes. And that is why the power cable should be in the middle. If the backbone is so big, what you'll end up having is multiple power supplies that are actually isolated from one another. 
on big boats, like I've done boats that have three decks, you know, we're doing the whole boat, digitizing everything. Like these are massive projects, thousands and thousands of hours. We'll have multiple power supplies like that where the power supplies are actually completely separate. They're not overlapping on one another. Like one does, you know, port, one does starboard, and then we'll have even separate networks and then you start bridging them. That gets in the stupid realm again. Anything's possible, remember, but we're gonna keep it vanilla, simple, right? Let's keep it simple. So what you would do on a normal boat is if you're installing a backbone and you're going from, you know, first deck, start it from the engine room, you go down, go up into the flybridge, the pilot house, maybe go to the flybridge, go up to the arch, right? You're probably gonna wanna install this power supply midway. So maybe you put it in, for example, in the pilot house, right? It's kinda halfway on the circuit. But again, you gotta draw it out. So you see how drawing it out makes it easy? Because you'll see right away, and if you don't think you have a problem, then just show it to someone, right? And I've got people that do that all the time with design. We do this stuff design remotely. People like, Jeff, I've got an idea of an enemy 2000 backbone I'm doing. Can you guys provide consultation? I just want you to tell me where I got it wrong. Ask questions. And then they'll send me their diagram. I'm like, okay, here, there, that, this, that. They're like, thank you. And then they go and install and implement. So um, you can actually have these backbone extension cable. You can have them everywhere. Or what we end up doing too is we'll end up doing service loops because you can actually do what are called field service ends. So maybe you've got nothing in the engine room you need now, but maybe one day you will. We'll actually route the cable thinking, okay, well maybe they'll want a battery monitor sensor. Maybe they'll want a, a temperature sensor in the bilge. Maybe they'll want a fire alarm in the bilge and they want an MEA 2000 to relay that information to the bridge. So we'll put basically loops in places where we think we might need to cut the cable and install the T later on. Because the beauty of an NMEA 2000 backbone is that you can actually interconnect all these different drops onto the backbone. And that information goes any to any. It's a bus. When you're troubleshooting one of these networks, <clears throat> besides actually figuring out that you actually have the right resistance and that your backbone is intact, what you'll probably end up doing is actually turning everything off and then turning things one at a time, right? It's all about disconnect. So you'll physically, to turn them on, you'll actually have to disconnect them and say, okay, I only have one device. Does it work? I'm putting a second one. Does it work? Everything is about incremental change. It's very hard to diagnose something if you're trying to do it all at once. Now there is actually, Maritron sells a diagnose device. You can have a laptop with a software with an NME A2000 to USB gateway. So I've got three of my technicians that have that. They'll go in, but then you're starting to be like this tech, right? You're going in the network, you're putting a T in, you're diagnosing, you're seeing the bus. You're not gonna be able to do that, most of you, right? You're gonna take a more simple approach. You're gonna be like, well, let's find the fault. Is there a faulty device on the network that's causing my bus to go down, right? And then you'll start doing it one at a time and then try to see if there's one that's mis misbehaving that's taking the whole network down. But that's how you troubleshoot an NME 2000 network. Any questions on NME 2000 troubleshooting? Yeah, go ahead. So the backbone is actually a long wire that runs up throughout the boat. Correct, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, it depends. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. You'd, you'd have to balance both. So it's both. Every one of those devices is known by what's called a LEN. You're like, what the hell is a LEN? A LEN is an acronym for load equivalent number. Every LEN is five milliamps. They're only allowed to ever draw more than five amps. A 20 LEN, which is one amp from the backbone. Meaning, if you have, for example, an intelligent transducer that has no other power coming from anywhere else, this device can get power from the backbone only if it draws no more than one app. A fuel sensor, same thing. Now, your chart plotter here is not drawing power from the backbone. It's too big. It's drawing three, four amps. It's got its own power supply, and effectively, it's not drawing anything from the backbone. Your instrument here could be NMEA 2000 powered only, 
or it could be NME 2000 connectivity and then power comes separately. So it, you have to think. You're like, oh, am I drawing anything? What's the land load on this? Oh, okay, where is it? What's the distance? Meritron makes an amazing app online where you can actually start dropping all of this and actually do what's called a configurator. Like you'll actually build your NME 2000 online, build it all out, and then you can start figuring out if you're loading it too much. These cables have maximum distances. They're only good to six meters. You can never have your backbone further away than six meter from any appliance. So that's why the backbone has to snake throughout the boat, right? And then when you snake it, you have to think, okay, what are the potential things that one day I'm gonna want to bring to that backbone? Because the beauty of this is that, think about right now on a boat, your gauges on your flybridge or wherever it is, it could be on your sailboat, they need, there's multiple wires that are leaving the engines coming back to one helm or another helm, right? The beauty of this is you decide that now you want, you've run the ME2000 backbone in your engine room, you've brought it to a pilot house, you brought it to flybridge, you brought it to your arch, and now one day you have a GPS on your arch. You're like, ah, you know what? It'd be nice to have a weather station. Really nice. Now the only thing you have to do is install the weather station, put a T in the arch, the cable's already there, and suddenly the weather station information is gonna appear on any device that chooses to display weather information. It could be an instrument uh, in the aft cockpit, it could be in the pilot house, or it can be in the flybridge. Now the other could be true too. What if you wanna have a smoke detector and you don't wanna run wires from your smoke detector because you can't hear the smoke detector because it's in your engine room and you wanna have it on your flybridge. Well, you would install an NME 2000 smoke detector in your engine room, plug it in, and suddenly the device on your flybridge would be able to see an alarm from a smoke detector without having to run a wire. That's why it's called a bus. It can carry a lot of info. <coughs> yes? Just comparing that to the uh, 1831, uh, 183. Yeah, 183. Um, if, if one item on this, though, can send the whole unit down. They're but not... The 18 three, at least you've got your GPS may still be on your chart plotter, even if your smoke alarm's gone. That's correct. You're, the, the point is, could one of these devices actually bring the whole network down? Yes, it's possible. Yeah, it's true. Extremely rare, though. Oh. Extremely rare. To be honest, the challenge with 0 3 it's such a mind-scratcher. It gets so involved. Most people can't get it. Like, I... By the way, it's great for me, by the way. Like selfishly, as a business owner, I love 0183. I love it. It's, I mean, it's great. I, I get hours. I mean, it's awesome. I can't do it. I try. I failed. I get it all the time. Okay, sure. Send a Navy SEAL down. No problem. We'll do it. No problem. I love it. The, the challenge is that the implementation of a 0183 network is extremely hard. And by the way, it does not allow for any redundancy, right? On a, this network, we don't show a GPS. But I can actually go in and I can say, GPS 1 is your primary, GPS 2 is a secondary, GPS 3 is a third, and I can actually have five GPSs on the network, all online, and if I lose one, the secondary picks up. I can say, you know what, that's secondary on the arch, that's a good one. The third that's in the flybridge, that's kind of forward, that we've got a little bit of occlusion and it's not great, that one I'll actually have as my third. So you can start having backups. This takes people out of the equation. I much rather deal with equipment failure than human involvement in a network. Sorry, but we're mostly, we're always the problem, right? I mean, let's be honest. Yes? So the 0183, would that be connected to that, to a T connector or one of the ends? No, uh, 0183 would be connected through, and I do this all the time. This is how you integrate old and new. Remember where I was saying, oh, you can have an old autopilot and you have a new complete system? You do that through a converter. And that converter, uh, sorry, is something like this. This is hard to see here because it's so white. It's an NMEA 2000 to as NMEA 0183. I put that device, I buy that device in like boxes, like crates. Yeah, but is it and then it's going to connect to NMEA 2000. Yeah, it will go to a T. Okay. Yeah, yeah. What, the output of that is a drop, and that drop connects to a T, right? 
Yes, question. If you want to upgrade your system and you have good old uh, monitors or something, would you prefer to put a bus in and then just map it out to the 183, or would you keep the 183 and then put it to a 2000? Yeah, so the question is, well, I'm trying, I'm going to try to repeat the question just so everyone can hear it, is if you've got an MEA0183 network on your boat, do you convert in multiple places and then bring it to a bus, or do you just leave the network alone and then convert it in one location? Is that correct? You'll most likely convert in one location unless your boat is so big that you have multiple locations of NMEA0183. So you would put a backbone in? Oh, yes, absolutely. When I do work on a boat, <clears throat> not myself, I, I mean our outfit, I'm always looking to the future. Right? And I know that I don't know what we're going to do five years, 10 years, 15 years down the road. So when I put an NMEA 2000 backbone, I put an NMEA 2000 backbone. And I basically strongly encourage someone to look into the future and make their life easy by not having to run another cable ever again from the engine room. You imagine the cost savings? If my job was, if everything was wireless on a boat, my labor revenue would go down by a factor of probably 80 to 85%. Everything about a boat is how do I go from here to there? It is crazy. That takes so much effort, right? So much effort. When you install an Enemy 2000 backbone, you're saying, I'm going to go through that pain once, right? And then every time I add a device, unless your boat is super huge and you're getting to this crazy point where you have too many nodes, but you won't, you'll run it once and every time you just add a drop. And then that information shows up everywhere. And by the way, there is no limit. Like after that, you just bridge networks. And on the big boats, we don't run one backbone cable, we run two. We actually go redundancy, right? Like we're thinking that cable took us five days to run through the boat. I'm not gonna run five days cable and say, oh, we have a break one day, what can I do? I'm like, no, I run everything twice. Like literally at the one time, I'm like, you're pulling two cables. Same thing with IP. When we run ethernet cables for IP cameras, I don't say, Oh, it's going to take us like 12 hours to run from a wing station down to the engine room. We're going to run one cable. And if it breaks, well, we'll just run another one. I'm like, Ethernet cable is free. You run two and you have a backup there. And sure enough, one day cable fails. You're like, no problem. There's a backup right there. Plug it in. It works. The engineers that are on board those boats are like, oh my God, thank you. I'm like, you're welcome. Right? Redundancy. Any other questions on ME2000? I'll get to you in just one second. Uh, one of the problems I see with that thing is, you know, you have your uh, depth sounder or whatever, the senders, but then it has to, it's putting the PGNs on the network, but then you have to have something that shows those PGNs, and a lot of those uh, things don't show all the PGNs. Yeah, so a PGN is a parameter group number, I think is what it is, something like that. It's sort of like a unique identifier for NMEA 2000. There's so much information, like what's depth, right? So it has a PGN. Right? Everything has sort of like a variable, right? What is that variable? And he's right. I mean, the question is, well, maybe this outputs information, but does this device able to see it? Yeah, okay. But honestly, unless you're right off field and you're going super deep into really weird sensors, a depth PGN is going to be pretty much shown by every instrument, right? Like these are now called, these marine instruments are sort of like, unlike in the past, you were thinking about a Raymarine, you know, that wind instrument that was an analog and it only showed one thing. Now you buy a Garmin GMI-20 or you buy a Raymarine instrument, that device can do multiple things. It's a portal to your data network. Now it will not do all PGNs and that's true. If it gets too technical, like for example, we did a boat where we converted the whole boat uh, to the, everything on the engines got converted to digital. The owner wanted to know everything digitally because the upper helm didn't have enough information on the gauges. It was kind of limited. And so we did digitize the whole engines. Everything on the engine we digitized. Now, knowing boost pressure or if your turbo temperature, what it is, that's not going to show up on a GMN 10 or GMI-20, right? Like, if you, on that engine, we had 20 variables for the engine, like we put sensors everywhere. Like the guy went, 
let's geek out together. I'm like, let's do it. Like, I'm loving this, right? Like, I, this is where I'm paid to be an engineer. And I'm like, this is amazing. Sure, you're not gonna see that on your Garmin chart plotter. At one point, the Garmin chart plotter goes, really? Like, like I, I'd never even thought of that. So then that's where you need sort of a proprietary screen, like a Maritron screen that goes, I do everything for you. And then you configure that on a Maritron screen, right? So there are limitations, but for most of us, and honestly, that's 99% of us, most of us are not gonna encounter that problem. Most of us are doing pretty common things. I'm always thinking about Gaussian distribution. Like most of us are right in the middle. There's people at the end, I'm off the spectrum, clearly. Like I geek out and I'm way three, three standards of deviation off and I'm probably all by myself. But most people are in the middle and most of the equipment will do what everyone wants to do. If you can't, then you have to spend more money on a more expensive screen from a, you know, someone like Maritron that basically, I'll do everything for you. Question, oh, you had a question in the back. Uh, I have, can you tell me what navigation system you have? Oh yeah, they do that, that's for the instrument, yeah, but that's only for the instruments still. Okay, so all of the things still. That's for, yeah, that's only, that's only for instruments. Yeah, your chart plotter is still standalone though. Okay, so it'll be on its own. Yeah, well no, they're going to be connected via NMA 2000. They, they will be completely, uh, but there's standalone pieces. I'll show you another device later on, I'll show you a little bit what that looks like. I'll bring that up, yeah. Is the Raymarine system, it's just proprietary, but it's, it's the same type of Yeah, Raymarine's awesome. Oh. Raymarine basically calls, if everyone says Bravo, they're like Alpha. Everyone says Up, they're like, oh no, Up is actually, actually you should call it Down. They're like, it's like all about confusion. I get this all the time, people are like, oh my God, I have a Raymarine system on my boat. And I'm thinking of upgrading my electronics. I think I can only ever have Raymarine forever on my boat because my boat came from the factory from Raymarine. And I've been led to believe that Raymarine is the only thing that will ever work on my boat. I'm like, yeah, I know. They, they want to make it sticky, but it's not that sticky. Like, so of course, when they, Garmin, they decide to play nice. They're like, oh, it's called NMEA 2000? Oh, we're not going to change the name and we're going to call it NMEA 2000. Raymarine, on the other hand, they're like, oh no, it's not NMEA 2000. We're going to call it CTOC NG, CTOC Next Generation. It's actually NMEA 2000, but they change the connectors. They're like, oh no, no, it wouldn't work. Then you buy a pigtail that goes literally from NMEA 2000 to CTOC NG. So it's all about creating confusion so that the people that do it themselves look at it and they're like, oh, this is too hard. I'm not going down that path. I'm just going to buy Raymarine always, forever, and then my life is going to be easy. But they do that to confuse the masses. Anybody who does electronics, they're like, yeah, come on, seriously? That's a roadblock? You're gonna have to try harder. <laughs> like, it's not because you call something a different name that I'm like really gonna lose it. Like, I can translate. All right, so again, sorry for the whitewash with the projector. It looks awesome on a screen. But this is an example of a Maritron here. And you can actually see, you know, we've got a temperature. This is actually pretty cool. Like a, this is a depth sounder that actually calculates depth. And we use this all the time on tons of boats as a redundant transducer that actually calculates depth inside the transducer. And then it outputs depth literally on that cable. So any device on the network that can read depth will get it. So trawlers, people that go up north or people that are going up to Queen Charlotte's and they're like, I've got only one depth transducer. I'm like, okay, maybe you have one. Let's install another one on a different frequency. Make it smart. Any device can see it. It's not a, you're not gonna see bottom imaging, but you're gonna get at depth. So I do that, I just did that on a 100 footer. Like, we put one in and we're like, putting a second one, it's $200. Why not have two depth transducers? Depth is useful. Like, it's right up there, there's propulsion, steering, which is kind of one and the same. There's a VHF radio, and then there's depth. Sorta of in that order is your top three things on your boat for safety. So having an intelligent transducer, you can do that with NMEA 2000. They're not expensive. It's not like a $5,000 line item, $200, right? Put one in the boat. The code is, you see, they're always showing, back to that question, where's the NMEA 2000 cable? Is it in the middle, right? Most of the time it is, assuming the network is balanced. 
right? You got a GPS antenna here. Remember what I was talking about before, the radar that doesn't radar really, that doesn't work? Because there was no heading, smart heading sensor? That's this, solid state compass. Maritron does one, Simrad does one, everyone does one. Garmin makes two variations, an expensive one, not expensive one. Then you've got this, another one, this is the display that shows everything, Maritron has them. Now they're starting to become pretty competitive in their screen uh, pricing. You can buy some that are just instruments, which is nice as well. Right, and then this device that pretty much every one of my technicians have, or if you have a laptop on your boat and you want to see all the information off your NME 2000 backbone, you're going to get a USB to NME 2000 converter. <clears throat> this is just a more stuff of basically uh, this, right? Simpler, more, and then it just gets more and more and more and more. Uh, it's, it's custom is a strong word. It's tailored, but you can build one in yourself. Like honestly, most of us are going to have a reasonable boat. You could draw it even up to 30, 40, 50 feet. You can draw this out by yourself. You just run a snake around your boat, and then you say, "What are the things in that boat that you're going to want to connect to?" Right? It's not that complicated. But again, it's the back to the thing. Draw it out. Don't do anything without a plan. And I just want to emphasize this. How many great things in life have worked out without a plan? They didn't make it to the moon by just trying. There was a little bit of work that happened before that. Anything of significance, a house, a building, anything starts with a concept. And you're like, okay, let's figure this out. Put it on paper. And then share it with someone. Oh, look, I'm doing this. What do you think? Oh, you're missing. If you do it on your boat and you're like, Oh, I did an NME 2000 backbone on my boat. What do you think? Oh, the input's going to be phenomenal. You can't see it. It's everywhere, hidden. Well, I think it's great. I mean, what, 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 what is someone, what kind of feedback can you possibly have if you're doing something that can't be seen? So, uh, I, sorry for this bit of a dumb question, but when you talk about the T's, like you, if you run this backbone, you want to put another T in. You, you actually cut the wire. And yeah. You, you can, you, well, it depends. If you have a point there where two wires were joined, a male and female were joined, because the cabling can, comes in length, if you have already a joint there, you would undo the joint, put a T in. Now, in some situations, you don't have, you never thought you would have one there. You can literally cut the cable, and you would put what's called a field service terminal. Right? Like Ethernet cables... I know we buy them at Future Shop or Best Buy, and they have ends on the end, right, RJ45s? But you can actually cut a cable and put your own end on it. Same thing with this. There are field service terminals that you can put for NME 2000. So you can retrofit things. Is that a pair of cable? Or? Oh, no, it's got five strands. Five strands, a shield, a pair for power, and a pair for comm communications. Okay? By the way, I could do an NME 2000 presentation for a weekend. Like, you want to geek out? Like, I could do, I mean, I'd love, I'd love to do a university course. You could spend a year just geeking out on every single topic. It could be multi-day courses, just on every single one. But I don't think I'd have a large audience. I'm really glad that you're here to share my enthusiasm for this. I'm surprised the room is this full, to be honest. <coughs> All right, any other questions on ME2000 before we start looking at other things here? All right, I just want to talk, because we're going to talk a little bit about NAV, and then we're going to do a little bit of electrical for troubleshooting as well. So we're going to do another about 20 minutes of NAV. Here's a high-level overview of the world today. I want you to remember that NME2000 isn't really something that has a significant enough baud rate or ability to communicate large files. If you're streaming video images, cameras, sounders, radars, these are large, that's a lot of data. That will never be on an NME 2000 backbone. That is not. NME 2000 is for small data, like depth, temperature, wind speed, AIS, little tidbits of information, right? Not big. So you look at this, the blue line here on this example from Garmin is NME 2000, meaning all these devices are sharing NME 2000 information, but it's low volume, it's not a lot of data. 
the baud rate is still within the land of the reasonable. Once you go to high amount of data, you have to have, now, of course, Garmin called it the Garmin Marine Network, but ultimately it is literally Ethernet. That's what it is, like we have at home. At the office, the world runs on this. All of this is Ethernet. So that means a radar, a sounder, your chart plotters, other chart plotters, all those devices that have high amount of data are gonna be over a Ethernet network. So on modern navigation systems, when you're talking from one device to the other, and this has been around since 2004 probably, when two devices are talking and sharing data, and I'm thinking Raymarine C-Series, and where you would configure one as a master and the other one as a slave, they would be sharing radar imaging. You know, one, one screen would have the radar, and then that radar would be sent the image to the other screen. That was done over Ethernet. Of course, Raymarine didn't call it Ethernet. <clears throat> they have its own name, but at the end of the day, it's an Ethernet network, right? All the companies are giving them their own names to make it complicated, but it's Ethernet. So you have two networks now on a boat. You have, and realistically, probably three. You have Ethernet, you have NME2000, and for those legacy pieces of equipment that you haven't changed to NME2000, there's NME0183. And then you have proprietary networks like CTOC, which is another boss topology network that Raymarine's own. And you can go from CTOC to NME2000 via converters. So on my boat, my instruments are all CTOC, my Raymarine instruments, and I'm converting all those instruments, CTOC, to NMA2000 via converter. And that converter is not expensive, it's about $150, $100. And so I'm converting CTOC information to NMA2000. So it's sort of like languages. There's all different sort of languages in the world. You want translators, right? How do you connect all these different systems on your boat? And again, draw it out. Because if you have, a, if you have wind on CTOC and you're wondering why your chart plotter is not seeing wind anymore, well, where could it be? Is it because you don't have wind? Or is it that you still have wind on your CTOC network, but the translator, the device that converts CTOC to ME2000 has failed. It's not getting powered. The fuse blew. It got disconnected, right? So it's about drawing things out. That's how you get to be a good troubleshooter. You have to know how things are connected. Otherwise, it's just magic, just magic. It's like, well, I don't know. I just don't know. And then you do what most people do, which, but I'm trying to train, is you call someone. Delegate the responsibility. And that's probably 40% of our business is there's people that are just on fire call. It's like, you don't know what you're doing tomorrow, but there's going to be a call tonight. I know I'm going to get a call, and then somewhere tomorrow you're going to go <coughs> solve a problem. We don't know what the problem is, but it's going to happen. And your job is to go solve a problem that nobody has called us yet for. So break fix, right? Service. But you can make your life easier if you know what's on your boat. And the technician's life easier too if they know. Otherwise, they're going to have to figure it all out. And that is expensive and frustrating. Because getting something to work is not as satisfying as putting something new on your boat. All right, so here's another example of what a typical topology looks like, right? You've got, you know, instrument, an autopilot, a VHF, an AIS transponder, NMEA 2000, all on a bus. And then that bus is talking also to chart plotters. And then you have a switch which talks chart plotter, chart plotter, sounder, radar. And on some boats, you'll have two radars, right? You'll have two sounders. Some boats, we did a boat, power boat, they had six, seven chart plotters, right? just starts adding. And then you've got cameras that come in there. So you could also start having IP cameras that can come in these devices. Notice this transducer is connected to the back of this sounder box. Very important to know, where's my transducer connected on my boat? Does it go to a black box? Does it go to an instrument? Or does it go directly to an MFD, a device that have a black box capability built into it? Right, because if it comes to the black, if it comes right to your display, that's easy to troubleshoot. Right, you start seeing the settings. A lot of times what happens is an owner goes in the settings, is playing with a sounder, changes the transducer type, stops working. Then we go in there, we rechange it the way it used to be, it starts working. But maybe the black box died. 
You know, there was a bad batch of black boxes that were from one manufacturer, shall name, un shall name nameless, for a period of time, and the black boxes would just die. They'd stop working. So we'd have to find the black box, get it, get it a refurbished one, a new one, change the black box, and now the transducer would work. Or if your network completely goes down, why does nothing talk to one another? Oh, well, maybe the switch went out. Maybe the power to the switch went out. That would be the only thing that would explain that this device, this device, this device, and this device don't see one another. How could all devices, what's the single point of failure? Right? Oh, the network switch went down. On bigger boats, you have multiple network switches. And on top of it, what's interesting is nowadays what they tried is they make it easy now. They'll have, some of these devices will have three network ports built in. So some devices are actually a switch built into them to make connectivity easy. So you can have a display at your helm, have a radar connected to it, another chart plotter right beside, and have the sounder connected to the back of it. No switch needed. They're trying to make it easy. But you have to draw it out. Any questions on a generic kind of nav system that you could encounter in a boat? All right, we're powering through everyone, we're good. We're good here. All right. Remember rule number one? Nothing's ever easy. Is That's what it looks like. You gotta be okay with it. And notice the power too, right? Power is a big issue for troubleshooting. Here's an example, and I decided to bring this in because this is a typical, Raymarine had a huge market share um, in the past, and this is a C-series, E-series, right? And this is a good example of a network that I find on boats all the time. I mean, anybody, show of hands, anybody in the room here who has Raymarine C-series or E-series on board? One, two, three, four, five, six, yeah, pretty common, I had on my boat. They had a huge market share. Big OEM base, right, installed at the factory. Actually, not a bad product line. Not a bad product. I really liked it. So you got your chart plotter. You could have multiple, right? You know, they had a C70, C80, C120, and then they did an E80, E120. Um, challenge for upgrading was, and it's not their fault. That's the world that was built back then. This chart plotter is connected directly to a radar via an analog wire, right? Like multiple strands. Today's... Uh, <clears throat> Today's radars are actually digital, meaning they have Ethernet and separate power. But if you have a typical network system like this on your boat, when you change a chart plotter, you actually change the radar because there's no more analog radar connectivity. So that's a big challenge. You literally have to change not only the radar, the cable, right? So you decide to change a chart plotter, you're changing the radar and the cable. And by the way, this is nice because everything's close, but on your boat, changing a radar cable, if you have it on the mast, on your sailboat, welcome to a world of pain. Running a radar cable from the mast down to your chart plotter up in the binnacle on a sailboat is not a two-hour task. If you do that, you will be seriously disappointed with your time management skills. It takes a long time to route a cable from a mast to a binnacle on a sailboat. But that's the pain you have because at the end of the day back then, it was non-digital. You'll notice Sea Talk instruments. This is what I have on my boat, right? All here. This is common, right? You have the digital sounder module. That's that DSM module, that black box that converts a transducer to a video image that other devices could see. So you would literally have, and notice here the radar is connected directly to the chart plotter, not to the switch, right? On modern stuff, it's connected to the switch. Now this one is actually, if it doesn't, if this is on, there's no radar here and here. And notice also how that screen is bigger than the other ones. Why? Because back then they would make master slaves. Right? Remote cameras. You could even do, I had PC-based navigation. You could actually have, it was called Raymarine Navigation System 6.0 where I had my laptop being a replication of this in the cockpit, not in the cockpit, but in the nav station. So, the reality is this. There is no generic playbook to solve an electronic problem because an electronic problem is specific to the equipment that you have on board. And it's specific in the sense that the topology changes depending not only on the manufacturer, but the generation of the equipment. 
if this, if you've got a Raymarine C Classic system, it's not the same as having a Raymarine Current system. You're going to be looking at the problem completely differently because they're not networked the same. Okay. This is an example of a Garmin system, more modern. And you'll notice there's no switch on here, right? The Garmin is directly connected to the chart plotter. Another chart plotter directly connected to there. Notice the transducer goes right into here, then shares that information what up here. And then over NMEA 2000, all this information is shared. So that's a common setup. You know, like we do a lot of power boats, lower helm, upper helm. We'll put a chart plotter with a built-in sounder device called the XSV down below. And that's what that is, XSV right here. We'll plug the transducer into here, then network cable up to there, and then a network cable from here up to there. Now, if this device is off, there's no sounder here. Or if this is off, there's no radar there, right? So there's, you know, you got to balance it. But it's all about balancing money, time, right? All those are variables. Remember, perfection is very hard to achieve and expensive. Notice there's a camera coming in. They have built-in decoders now, but once you want more cameras, you need a separate decoder, and then you feel it as a video image. They can do a couple of cameras, I think. But some boats, they want four, so they want eight. <sighs> so that's how you would go. You want to have your layout. Think about your layout. What is connected to what? How is it communicating? This is communicated via Ethernet, right? And then power is the big one, right? Make sure there's actually power at the device. But worrying about a break in a cable, to be honest, it's such an outlier. It's so rare. So rare. Unless, of course, and I always ask the question, you know, I got a, someone that's got a radar arch. Has anybody been drilling in your radar arch recently? Right? Like, you don't know. Canvas guy? No. Okay. Yes? Oh, really? Oh, interesting. Somebody was working up on your bimini uh, beside your radar arch. They were mounting stuff. Sure enough, one boat went right through a cable, drilled, created a short. Okay, that's easy, right? Spen expensive to fix, but you know what? I can live with that because at least we didn't look around too long to fix it, right? To find out what the problem was. Any questions on, this is probably a very vanilla standard auto, not autopod, navigation system on a boat between anywhere between probably 25 to 50 feet. Any questions on what that looks like or how you would go about troubleshooting this? Any comments, feedbacks? Does that make sense? You got basically Ethernet here, enemy 2000 over there. So this is just simply an extension of what we talked about. Notice how there's an AIS 600 here, right? It's pretty easy. And they're just showing one antennas, but you can have multiple GPS antennas on this. Now, here's where it, yeah, go ahead. So we, we have a new boat, and everything's already kind of installed. And I want to make a diagram, but I don't know how to get all the instruments to install behind walls. Yeah, of course. What do you do? That's, that's, that's called pain. That's a lot of pain. That's a lot of pain, yeah. It's funny, you know, it's a weird world. Yeah, you just pain. You go slowly, map it out. It's like a flashlight. Imagine yourself in a very, very dark room. And you just have a laser pointer and you're like, oh, now I got two connectors there. Oh, wonder what those are. Put them on a diagram, question mark, question mark. Next time you open something else, you see, oh, oh, yeah, that's there. Question mark, erase with eraser, now that's that. You can, I mean, unless you really want, and that's hard, especially on the smaller boats, <clears throat> you don't have space. A lot of this stuff is so packed in there. You know, like you buy a 35-footer boat, I'm not sure what your size is, but at one point you get you get so much information and they go down these bundles and you have no idea, right? Like even on a 50 foot boat, sailboats, they're small too. Power boats is different. Then you start having a little bit more space. But I work on, you know, Grady Whites or, Ocean, or Boston Whalers that are 30 feet. They have as much stuff as the 45 foot trawler. They're just a smaller boat, but everything's on that boat. And then the wiring is really tight because you can't see anything. And they're behind panels. But you start mapping, taking pictures. You know, I like it sometimes I meet these owners and we're going through the system together. We do this service called an electrical orientation. It's not electrical audit. It's sort of like, I don't know anything on my boat. I'm not worried that it's not safe, but can you tell me how it all plays together? And I got this one owner once, he had his iPad and he's taking pictures of everything. And then he's drawing with a PDF writer on top 
what everything is? He's like, well, we don't know what that is. And I'm like, I don't know. I've never seen that before. But that is a question mark. That's a blank. You got to wonder. Every time you're looking through, I wonder what that does. And then you start having these open-ended questions that don't have an answer, but eventually will. You'll never be able to answer it all at once. You couldn't even, it would be, even to de delegate that task to someone would be not days. It would be a full, like, it's an expedition. It'd be like, stay on my boat, and when you're done, maybe at the end of the summer, we'll talk. I mean, you couldn't. It would take forever. So you just start slowly. But what you do as an owner is every time you tackle something or you have someone tackle something, start documenting. Be curious. Any other questions on this? All right. It gets worse. <laughs> and this is not even that big. It's, it's starting, but it's not that bad. It looks bad, but it's not crazy. Right? <laughs> It gets, you know, it gets bad, but again, you gotta, that's where at one point, when you're starting at that level, you know, when we get to that level, it, you definitely need documentation. Otherwise, you are literally gonna make your life complete hell. But same thing, you know, you've got red, right? For enemy 2000 here. You've got all these multi-touch boxes, right? But they're talking ethernet, right? They don't even actually sell, they used to not even sell their own hubs or switches. You would just put a third-party switch in. Furuno didn't make any, they're not a marketing company. They just don't bother with stuff like that. They're like, just buy a switch. It's going to work, right? And so you would actually just buy a switch. You can see they've got a black box AIS transponder and FA50. Heading sensor, really popular, right? If your radar doesn't work, you're going to be looking, well, why is my radar overlay not working? But my radar works on the radar page. Uh, probably your heading sensor failed. This is a device, you know, if you've got junction boxes, it's a way of aggregating all this information. Translating that information from, you might have some, some devices, there, most devices will do the translation between NMA2000 to Ethernet to share to other devices <coughs> on the chart plotter itself, right? They're going to actually go, okay, I've got all this information. Like, for example, a really cool one is Vesper. They're actually, the one I was talking about, the AIS, they'll actually take all information, be it 0183, NMEA 2000, they're going to aggregate it, and then they're going to take it, and then if you want, you can actually see on your phone, it's a portal to not only things that are AIS, but all data on your boat, like depth, wind speed, speed on ground, course on ground, sea temp, whatever it is, sort of data, and you're seeing all this data right on your phone. So it's a portal to all your navigational or kind of data. You're not going to see a radar image. You're not going to see a chart plotter, but you're going to see data on there. All right, we're going to take a small break, and then we're going to dive into electrical troubleshooting. All right.